Thank you. This is, uh, we've just come back from a break. It is still February 10th, Thursday, and this is still Senate Government Operations. <laughs> and um, I'm going to welcome everybody here. We're going to run through, do a walkthrough of S250. And um, I am going to say that we are not going to, there is a section in here that, um, it's section two that deals with the private right of action, which is the same as the qualified immunity. We're not gonna walk through that at all. So Ben, you're probably just, I don't know if that frees you up or not, but since the judiciary is doing that bill, we won't be, we won't even walk through it in here. Okay, that sounds great. We'd love to have you stay. <laughs> But I don't know if you had input into any of the rest of the bill, but thank you for, for coming. But I think that it doesn't make sense for us to walk through it when it's been, had hours and hours and hours of testimony in judiciary. So, okay, thank you. But we will walk through the rest of the bill. And so th thank you. Um, so uh, who, who was our drafter? It was Ben. Me. Oh, Ben, did you draft the whole thing? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. So I, I'm, I'm sorry. So I just almost dismissed you and I shouldn't have. <laughs> but thank you. Okay. So Ben, if you would like to walk us through the rest of the bill without that section. Sure. Thank um, you. Well, sorry about that. No, no worries. Uh, my name is Ben Novogrosky. I'm uh, from the Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, and I did have a question for you, Chair White. Um, mm -hmm. As far as the walkthrough, I can give sort of a broad overview of each section, or if I can also go line by line. I know that there are a lot of witnesses on the slate. Um, so with just being mindful of everyone's mm -hmm. time, uh, I wanted to ask what you would prefer. I think maybe a broad overview makes sense. I, I Hopefully we have had the opportunity to read it and we will, and this isn't the only day we will be doing this, but I wanted to, for us to get a broad understanding of what it is and have some testimony on kind of the broad understanding. So I think that that makes sense. Does that make sense committee to do it that way? Uh, it's 20 okay. pages. If we do line by line, we'll be here till a long time. Okay, yes. Okay, Th thank you, Ben. Okay, and with that, I'll- Ben, do you know everybody on this committee? Uh, no, this is my okay. first time appearing. I'm uh, with, so we're going to introduce ourselves. I think everybody else knows us, but I'm Jeanette White from Wyndham County. I'm Anthony Polina from Washington County. Ryan Collimore representing the Rutland County District. Allison Clarkson representing the Windsor County District. Aisha Ram Hinsdale, Chinning County and Ben, you helped me write this bill, but I've never seen you before. So <laughs> really appreciating all your hard work and inheriting pieces of it from Bryn and all, all those things. So thank you. Pleasure. And so when um, did you start, Ben? Ben, you, when did you start? Just this. I started in November. So I uh, had to hit the ground running with a lot of things uh, to get it all in place before uh, bill deadlines. But, um, you know, that's how you learn best, right? So it's been it's been good. Right, and Ben has quite an impressive background. Yeah, um, prior to my time here, I worked as a prosecutor for OPR for almost two years. And before that, I worked in civil, uh, as a litigator in private practice for just over five years, um, focusing on some complex litigation, um, but every, really ran the gamut between you know low level criminal cases to um, complicated securities and commercial litigation as well. That was here in Vermont? Yeah, um, I, I worked at a, a small but mighty firm in, in Stowe. <laughs> small but mighty. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, if you would take us away. Sure, and since I'm doing a broad overview, I'll refrain from sharing my screen for, for now. Yeah, that's um, great. We all have it, I think, in front of us or on a device. Great. So this is uh, S-250, which is entitled an act uh, relating to enhanced administrative and judicial accountability of law enforcement officers. Uh, the purpose of, of this bill, it proposes to provide greater accountability for law enforcement officers, including the creation of a private right of action against law enforcement officers 
that prohibits common law and statutory immunities as a defense, which we will not go into today. Uh, this bill also provides specific parameters concerning independent investigations of police misconduct, anti-bias training for law enforcement officers, and the creation of a law enforcement officer database with related disclosures during criminal prosecutions. The bill also provides the Office of the Attorney General with authority to investigate complaints of a pattern or practice of discriminatory, discriminatory conduct by a law enforcement agency and initiate civil enforcement proceedings if necessary. So starting with section one of the bill, section one of the bill would add a section 169 to title three of the Vermont statutes annotated. This would empower the office of the attorney general to conduct pattern or practice investigations of discriminatory conduct by law enforcement agencies. As part of the investigation, the attorney general is authorized to issue subpoenas to relevant witnesses or for the production of documents. After an investigation is complete, the attorney general uh, must issue a public report detailing its findings. However, the content of the investigation, including witness identities and evidence gathered is confidential subject to certain enumerated exceptions. Uh, and any state or local employee that discloses a pattern or practice of discriminatory conduct is protected from retaliation. Ultimately, the AG is authorized to file a civil enforcement action against a law enforcement agency if an agreement to cure or eliminate the pattern or practice of discriminatory conduct cannot be reached or needs to be enforced. Moving on to, well, skipping section two and moving on to section three. Section three uh, would amend Section 2358 of Title 20, which concerns law enforcement minimum training standards. The bill would increase the amount of anti-bias and fair and impartial policing training uh, from uh, four hours to 10 hours. Uh, and that would go into effect before the end of this year. Uh, and then also uh, law enforcement officers would be required to receive a 10 hour refresher course in each training and such training every odd number year. Uh, under the current law, there is no hour requirement for the refresher course. Can I just interject to say the first section is something that AG's office did request, and this section is something Aton requested. So I just want to make that clear in case you, if you want to build a witness list or get more curious about any of these things. Thank you. Um, moving on to section four. Section four concerns data collection of law enforcement encounters resulting in death or serious bodily injury. This would amend subsection 2366, subsection E of Title 20, which currently concerns race data collection. The amendment would expand data collection from only roadside stop data to include law enforcement encounters result, resulting in an officer involved death or serious bodily injury. Uh, an officer involved, de involved death or serious bodily injury is defined as the serious bodily injury or death of an individual resulting directly from an action of a law enforcement officer while the law enforcement officer is on duty or while the law enforcement officer is off duty or performing activities that are within the scope of their duties. Uh, serious bodily injuries has the same meaning as in section 1021 of title 13. Um, the substantive changes to the law though concern the data required to be collected for law enforcement encounters involving uh, death, uh, officer involved death or serious bodily injury. These, uh, the data required to be collection would include, collected would include the age, gender, and race of the decedent or injured person, the grounds for the encounter, the grounds for the search and the type of search conducted, and any evidence located, whether physical force was warned or threatened, the type of force used, and whether a written warning, civil violation, a civil violation citation, or misdemeanor or felony citation which it was issued, or if no action was taken at all. May I ask a question, Ben? Yes, Senator White. So um, <clears throat> currently this information is not collected on all stops, and this is would just be those stops for um, resulting in um, officer involved death or serious bodily injury. So I guess my question is, this is after the fact. 
So it, how do you collect the data? Because you don't know that when the stop is made, if you didn't collect the data then, and then there turns out to be, I, I mean, I guess I'm a little confused about the, the um, logistics, not, not the concept itself, but just the logistics of how that would work. Sure. Um, well, I may not be the best person to speak to okay. logistics, um, but uh, so I'm, I'm a little hesitant to get into the details on that. Okay. Well, I'll wait then and maybe Jennifer or Chris Bricklow or somebody can answer that question. Thank you. Sure. Um, and then finally, this, this section of, bill, of the bill would take effect on September 1st of this year. And moving on to section five, uh, which concerns independent investigations of law enforcement use of force. Uh, this would create a new section 2370 in Title 20, um, and it concerns uh, investigations in law enforcement use of force resulting in serious bodily injury or death. The section um, requires that the Vermont Criminal Justice Council launch an independent investigation whenever a police officer uses physical force in the line of duty resulting in death or serious bodily injury. The council is required to form a three-person panel with certain requirements aimed at ensuring independence. Uh, specifically, the panel must have at least one member who's not a current or former law enforcement officer and no panel member may be a current or former employee of the law enforcement agency under investigation. Uh, additionally, the law enforcement agency subject to the investigation must pay for its costs. And at the conclusion of the investigation, the panel must provide a report to the council. Uh, the report must be made public if the panel determines that there is no basis for prosecution. Um, and this section goes into effect in, on October 1st of this year. Moving on to section six. six. This is um, the creation of a law enforcement officer information database, which is more colloquially known as a GLEO database. Uh, this would add a section 2371 to title 20. Uh, the database would catalog potential impeachment information concerning law enforcement agency witnesses or affiants. It is designed to enable a prosecutor to disclose such information consistently, appropriately, and pursuant to legal obligations. The Vermont Criminal Justice Council would be responsible for maintaining the database. Uh, the information stored in it would, in, uh, would include any finding of misconduct relating to the truthfulness or a possible bias of a police officer, any past or pending criminal charge brought against a police officer, any allegation of misconduct bearing on truthfulness, bias, or integrity uh, of a police officer that is subject of a pending investigation, any prior findings by a judge that a police officer testified untruthfully, made a knowingly false statement in writing, engaged in an un unlawful search and seizure, or illegally obtained a confession. Uh, it would also include a finding or pending allegation that either casts substantial doubt upon the accuracy of any witness that a prosecutor intends to rely on to prove an element of any crime that's been charged or that might have a significant bearing on the admissibility, admissibility of prosecution evidence. Uh, the database would also include information that may be used to suggest a police officer is biased for or against the defendant or information that a law enforcement officer's ability to perceive and recall the truth may be impaired. Um, the law enforcement agency must report any information required to be cataloged in the beta database within 10 days of discovery. Each state's attorney and the attorney general must have access to the database for the purposes of complying with their disclosure requirements during prosecution of, of crimes. Otherwise, the database is confidential and shall not, shall not be accessible by any other entity, including the Vermont Criminal Justice Council, unless access is in furtherance of the council's duties. Uh, the entities with access are permitted to produce information pursuant to a pu public records request and any exceptions that may apply. And then this section would go into effect on January 1st of 2023. Section seven of the bill concerns law enforcement agency internal investigation requirements. So this would amend section 2401 of title 20 
which is the definition section. Uh, and it relates to the agency's investigation uh, of a law enforcement officer's violation of an agency rule or policy or state or federal law. Um, the bill requires that a three member investigative team conduct an investigation rather than the current requirement of a single investigator. The three member team must include at least non, one non-law enforcement civilian, not more than one member who is not a current or former law enforcement officer and not more than one member employed or previously employed by the agency employing the officer subject to the investigation. The section of the bill also expands the definition of what invalidates an investigation of a police officer uh, to include a violation of the three member investigative team requirements. Moving on to section eight, uh, this bill adds a section 6608 to Title 13, which is essentially a codification of Brady disclosure requirements. Um, those requirements require a prosecutor to make a timely and appropriate disclosure of exculpatory and impeachment information to a defendant in a criminal prosecution. Exculpatory just means that it tends to negate guilt. Uh, prosecutors are already subject to these to these obligations, they typically happen fairly soon after a charge is filed. Uh, however, this would codify those obligations um, and give some uniformity to what is expected. Um, and specifically, a prosecutor will be required to disclose information known to the prosecution team, which would include all prosecutors and all law enforcement officers that participated in the underlying investigation of the offense that tends to negate the guilt of the defendant of the underlying charge, it may reduce a defendant's sentence or any material information that casts substantial doubt on the accuracy of evidence that the prosecutor, prosecutor will rely upon in the case. The disclosures must be made, made as soon as is practicable after a not guilty plea is entered in a criminal case and the obligation applies to additional information that is discovered prior to or during trial. Uh, this section of the bill would take place or would go into effect on October 1st of this year. And finally, moving on to section nine, this is a prohibition on involuntary confessions based on false information provided by a law enforcement officer. Uh, this would create a new six, section 6609 in title 13. Um, and specifically, this new law would prohibit any written or oral statement or admission made by a defendant from being received in evidence if it was made involuntarily. Um, a statement would be considered involuntary if a law enforcement officer knowingly provides false facts about evidence to the defendant, and such false facts either undermine the defendant's reliability or create a substantial risk of false incrimination. Um, and unless I made mention of it, uh, specifically in each section, all of these uh, provisions go into effect of July of this year. Um, and so I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I, um, yes. Well, I just, I thought in this bill, but I could be wrong because it had a lot of moving pieces. There was also the, um, you couldn't coerce a confession based on false information. Well, that would be, be that is, covered by this. Oh, last that was, oh you said that. Time. Sorry, I missed it. Okay. That it would not be received into evidence if it was um, considered involuntary. Okay. Sorry, the words didn't. It's okay. There's yeah. a lot to go through. Yeah. <laughs> so I just have a couple technical questions, and then I do have some questions about how it fits in with the some of the sections fit in with what's currently happening under the professional regulation. Um, committee at the Criminal Justice Council and some things like that. But so in section one, it only ref it only pertains to municipal and sheriffs. So that it doesn't give the attorney general any ability to um, investigate any pattern of um, discrimination or bad act um, practice of discrimination by the um, Vermont State Police or Fish and Wildlife or DMV or any of those. It's just. Yeah. Yes, that's that's correct. Okay. And, there, and then and I just, in the rest. 
Sorry, yes. that was a concern of mine too. The attorney general wanted this power that exists in other states, but obviously like fish and wildlife, you know, wardens and Vermont State Police and others are the attorney general's, you know, clients. Um, so it couldn't necessarily apply to them. It wouldn't make sense. So this is where we located this, um, which currently if someone calls the HE's office and says they have a concern about a local law enforcement agency, there is nothing that could be done after that. But, hmm. okay, if they call the AG's office, but if they called the, anyway, okay, Senator Clarkson. So who, who does then, who, who does? Well, that, that's not a technical question for Ben, okay. I don't think. Okay, sorry, sorry. That's, Just curiosity. I, I think we're going to get into some of the policy issues and how the, currently works and what what this does but in the so that was my question but then in the rest of the bill when it says law enforcement agency it is the standard definition of law enforcement agency is that right well it would each each section um would have its own definition yeah. um you know yeah. and, and so that's uh, yeah. a lot of times it refers back to the definition under 2351a so for instance in not to bring up section two, but that's what it refers to in section two is 2351A's definition. So it, it does vary throughout the bill. Yeah, okay, I just I just needed to clear that up in my own head here. Are there other questions of a technical or drafting nature for, for Ben? Okay, so I think what we'll do then is um, jump, I, I'm loath to try to look at my um, agenda to see who's next on the list because when I did that before, I got completely kicked out of the meeting. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to ask. I guess I would. I'll start with the commissioner, and then and then I think go to um, uh, Mr. Sorrell. Is that or did you do you have a preference of how we would do this? Me? No, the the people who are testifying. You want? Okay, Commissioner, I guess I'm going to start with you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, for the record, Mike Sherling, Commissioner of Public Safety. Thanks for uh, having us in on these important topics. Um, I don't. I think because it's walkthrough day uh, rather than getting in the the nuances of. Uh, of the bill, I'll just uh, speak for a couple of minutes, um, sort of from a satellite view, and then turn it over to other witnesses. Um, the uh, there are a number of things in here that are uh, areas that certainly warrant uh, further um, exploration uh, as we continue our statewide efforts to modernize and uh, and improve uh, operations uh, in uh, the law enforcement sphere. Um, there are a few that um, are a little duplicative of some of the existing systems. So trying to figure out how they weave into uh, some of the work that you've already done and some systems that are still uh, in an evolution uh, will be important. Uh, a couple of sort of global um, observations. Um, one, well, there's, uh, there's a couple of really good nuggets in here. I think it's important to note that the uh, policing in Vermont is in a period of extraordinary uh, evolution um, in terms of pace. We've always been evolving, but the pace of that evolution has accelerated, of course, in the last couple of years. And there's a number of things that are still um, very much top of mind in terms of uh, things that are evolving today, uh, and a lot of it based on on work that you've done in the last couple of years. So uh, I, I worry about adding a lot of additional complexity without letting some of the things that are in play today um, settle a little bit, because the more complexity we add, the more chance there is that um, we will not do a satisfactory job of ensuring that the modernization efforts that are in play are executed well. I think so far it's been, things have been executed ex extremely well, but we just have to be mindful of that. Um, the second thing is that, um, you know, while there's some good things here, um, I do want to caution the, um, the committee and the General Assembly as a whole that the approaches taken while um, they have been constructive have all largely been at the back end of the system um, to try to hold officers accountable for this 
perception that there's widespread um, misconduct and problems occurring in Vermont law enforcement. Um, and there's been not a lot of focus on um, really supporting uh, the critical work uh, of our law enforcement and public safety professionals, investing in uh, hiring and training and good supervision, good supervisory training, investing in uh, communities to help them select the best executives to lead their law enforcement organizations, et cetera. So I, it, it's a bit of a plea to restore some balance to the conversation to ensure that they feel valued, that we're investing in them for the best outcomes, and we're not exclusively looking at the back end of the system and, try, and trying to figure out how to hold people accountable when, um, when misconduct occurs or mistakes happen. So I just provide that as an important piece of context because as we get into the weeds on some of these bills, they're almost exclusively addressing the back end. And um, if you use a healthcare um, analogy, which we like to use in public safety, you know, prevention is the best tool we've got. Education is the second best tool. Um, and by the time you're at the, the stage where we're trying to fix problems, you're spending a lot of money, it's really complicated and the bad outcomes have already occurred. So. Um, I would urge us to um, take a view that um, balances the front end of, this, uh, of the process of good outcomes um, equally, um, if not more so uh, than where we've been focused over the last uh, 18 months or so. Um, so I'll pause there. I, I'm happy to do a little bit of a walkthrough of the sections, but I think that also can wait in favor of allowing the other witnesses to, to weigh in. Thank you. I, I think I just changed my mind about where we're gonna go next. Sorry, Bill, I saw you just unmuted yourself. But I, I think because um, a, a, lot, most, a lot of this is um, applicable to everybody who's here, but the, section, the first section seems to be applicable to the Attorney General's office in particular. And I see that Julio is here. So I think I might jump to Julio to comment on um, section one. I'm happy to defer to Julio, Senator, in order. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, yes, let me uh, make sure I'm connected fully here. We can hear you, we can't see you yet. I'm, I'm working on it. Thank you. There you are. Hi, yeah, I'm Julio Thompson. I'm an Assistant Attorney General and Director of the Attorney General Civil Rights Unit. Um, <clears throat> Section one, uh, I, I could talk a little bit about section one of uh, uh, Act 250 as, it, as it's drafted here and also talk a little bit about pattern and practice investigations generally, um, which um, you know, this, is, this basically confers the power that the US Department of Justice has had um, since 1996 and invested it in the, the attorney general or a designee of the attorney general. So as, as drafted here, there is a provision for the attorney general's office not to do the investigation, but to designate someone else. Um, and, I, and I wasn't involved in the drafting, but I would, presumably that would be where there might be a situation of, of conflict. Um, my background, I, I have a little bit of a background in pattern and practice investigations. I've, um, participated in several. Um, one, I, I started in the 1990s for Los Angeles County. There was a six month uh, independent commission pattern and practice investigation of the LA County Sheriff's Department, uh, which led to uh, an agreement between the county and the sheriff and the creation of the, the country's first uh, um, police monitor that would report on the progress of reforms. Um, that was about five years before the the federal law was enacted. Uh, I've also served as an, an expert um, for uh, the U.S. Department on Justice on pattern and practice investigations of the Metropolitan Police in Washington, D.C., uh, the Chicago Police Department, the Baltimore Police Department, and uh, the Louisville, um, I'm, I'm sorry, the Springfield, Massachusetts Police Department. I'm currently working with US DOJ on the Minneapolis, Louisville, and Phoenix Police Department pattern and practice investigations, which are, are just underway. Um, 
a couple of things about how they, these actually work. Um, they are uh, cases where the U.S. Department of Justice or the investigating agency receives information um, from various sources. It could be media, it could be local law enforcement, it could be members of the community um, and organizations as well as members at large or local prosecutors uh, about um, uh, actual or perceived or suspected um, systemic uh, uh, violations of, uh, of legal rights, usually constitutional rights, but also some statutory rights and privacy rights and so forth by a, by a police department. Um, they are significant F, F uh, investments in time. Uh, they take a long time. Some of the US DOJ investigations lasted 18 months. Um, they involve a lot of collection of records, interviews of witnesses, town meetings, uh, forensic review of records, medical records, body-worn camera, um, typically the hiring um, of multiple subject matter experts on issues relating to de-escalation, communications, tactics, search and seizure, preservation of evidence, uh, responding to sexual assault uh, complaints uh, uh, reported by the public and so forth. Um, so I, I think that the, the Attorney General's office um, in Vermont would not be the first office to, uh, to have this authority. There are several states that have enacted statutes, California, Nevada, um, uh, are, are the ones that come to mind for me right now. I think this, this bill has some features of the Nevada system. Uh, there, Vermont's bill here is a little bit different than those other ones. And the other ones, the, the authority of the attorney general is to investigate any government body. It isn't limited to law enforcement. And I don't believe any of the statutes exclude state law enforcement. Um, so this one is a, is a little bit narrower in that respect. Um, some of the statutes uh, do not have subpoena power. Um, this one does, which I think would be appropriate. We would expect cooperation by any agency that, that um, um, what was facing an investigation or, or even just a preliminary inquiry. But uh, for the purposes of some records that are held by police departments under state or federal law, you might need a subpoena uh, in order to authorize release um, from the department. Or, um, or maybe state's attorney's offices if they have those materials in hand and there may be medical records and telecommunications records and so forth that would have to be subpoenaed. So uh, subpoena power um, can, can be useful. Um, this bill, like the other state pattern practice bills, um, uh, contemplates the entry of a um, uh, of a settlement um, that typically referred to as consent degrees, although sometimes they're just MOUs filed with the court without the filing of a civil complaint. Um, and, uh, and also a public report regarding its findings one way or the other. Um, that's, that's pretty typical. Um, the committee members, if they haven't had an opportunity to look at that, um, I'm sure Ledge Council or I could provide you links to an, any number of reports. Um, there are over two dozen that have been done uh, relating to police departments um, uh, throughout the country since the federal law was enacted. Um, some of those are longer than others. Um, some of those uh, make a finding that there's no pattern in practice, but issue something called a technical assistance letter where during the course of the investigation, they might identify shortcomings in equipment, resources, or training that the department, you may, may place the department's operations at risk. And uh, sometimes DOJ works with uh, the agency collaborative, collaboratively, sometimes at the agency's own an invitation. Uh, for example, for Metropolitan Police Department, um, Back in 1999, then Chief uh, Ramsey, uh, who was new to the department, um, asked DOJ to, to take a look at the department he was, he was then heading. Um, I guess what I would say about consent decrees also, um, I've also worked on a number of the consent decrees, Washington, DC, Seattle. Um, let's see what else. Uh, there's an injunction for Maricopa County, Arizona, where Sheriff Joe Arpaio used, used to work. 
Um, and then I'm currently serving on the uh, consent decree team for Newark, New Jersey, um, which recently crossed its fifth year. Um, consent decrees, uh, the length of them can vary by the size of the department, the resources to make the needed changes, and also just the, the difficult or intractability of some of the issues that a department might face. Um, for the consent decrees that I've worked on, they have been larger departments, um, uh, larger, I don't think there's, yeah, I think larger than any department that Vermont has. Um, and, um, but they, they, they're multi-year affairs. Um, it's a process of identifying um, gaps in policies, procedures, resources, working with the community and the department and experts to change those in alignment with the sit with what the departments agreed to do, uh, getting court and monitor approval, um, and then moving on to training. And um, if there are additional you know, resources to be provided, uh, new personnel or re reassignments, um, you work through that. Um, so I, so I think they are very worthy projects, but I also just want folks to appreciate that um, neither the investigation nor any agreement after is, is an overnight success or, or progress um, um, because it can, be, it can be costly. Some departments simply don't have the money to staff their 911 centers, let alone um, you know, deploy as many um, body worn cameras or other resources or add training or, or civilian personnel. So um, I think it, I just want to add a bit of realism there. I haven't worked on any consent decree that's been less than five years, but again, those are departments that are bigger than any in Vermont. Um, so I think that if uh, we're going to move forward with this, which our office thinks it's a good idea to have this authority, doesn't mean we're going to use it frequently, but I think it's good a good tool to have as part of the overall accountability system. Um, I, I think there needs to be um, testimony and examination of what resources are appropriate to make sure that um, that uh, this kind of program being added to an attorney general's office isn't set up for failure or. or uh, diminish expectations because of lack of resources. I'll, I'll stop there and answer any questions if you like. Thank you. I do have one question just of, and maybe it's too much into the weeds right now, but we do have the bill in front of us and I, sure. if, so the um, number two under E and on mine, it's on page four, but I think what I have is the final draft, not as introduced, so it might be on a different page. It's an investigation concluding that a pattern or practice of discriminatory conduct could not be substantiated. Um, but then it says that it will be closed, but shall be archived and may be used as an aggravating factor in any civil action. But if it was not substantiated, how can it be used as an aggravating factor in a civil action? If there was, if it was found that there was nothing there, what's to use? Well, it could be that facts that are identified in in the report, um, not not a, not a legal conclusion of uh, a pattern and practice of a violation of law, but there could be. Um, practices by the department which the investigation notifies the department creates a heightened risk oh. for uh, okay. harm to the public or officers. I'll, I'll give you an example okay. um, from, from uh, the Chicago Police Department investigation uh, where I, I looked at one of my, I had several areas of focus. One of them, one of them was, was deadly force and the, the DOJ findings, the public findings noted that um, Chicago Police Department had for certain parts of the city and certain units, a culture of what's, what is known as jump outs. And jump outs are, um, they're they're, it's not that, it's kind of an older term, but it, it, it's essentially the practice of going in an area where the department of the community, a city thinks there's high drug activity, a street corner with a lot of people on the street corner and an unmarked car 
screeches to a halt, you know, accelerates towards the quarter and screeches to a halt uh, as a practice to provoke member, uh, people on the, the corner to run. And then the officers chase the person. They're in a high drug area and they're gonna chase the person. And sometimes those pursuits go through alleys and involve fence hopping. And then the officers are in a situation where they may end up using force against an individual. Uh, either deadly force or other kinds of force. Because they're alone, they may be separated from their partners, they may be at a tactical disadvantage, they may be physically tired. And so the investigation might find that the cases that they, they identified, you couldn't have substantiate whether the force in a substantial number of those cases was unconstitutional, illegal. But it, it, it might point out, as the DOJ port, report did, point out that that practice had, was associated with a high rate of uh, deadly force and significant force incidents. So serious injuries from a baton yeah. uh, or improvised weapons like boards the officer ended up using because they were in a fight. Um, and if, the, if you have that evidence and you put it on notice that you have a cultural practice uh, that may be consistent with stated policies about interactions with the community. Um, later on, if there are cases where um, the department is in a civil action regarding a case where there's alleged con unconstitutional violation from a future jump out and foot pursuit and deadly force. Uh, one of the questions for liability for Chicago would, in that case would be, is this the sort of behavior that the department countenances? Do they endorse that sort of behavior? That's a link that um, you sometimes have to establish to have the city on uh, liable beyond the individual officers. And if, the, and if there's evidence in a report that this practice was well known to the department, it was discussed in interviews and it was published in a report, and yet the city persisted uh, in that conduct, um, it could be that that information and the department and the cities and the department's knowledge of that practice, which they then continued, notwithstanding the stated or identified risks, um, you know, could be relevant. You would have to decide on a case by case basis. Um, so the mere fact that you identify a practice, another one in the Baltimore investigation, which I also participated in. Baltimore police officers in the public report were noted that they um, used tasers on, sub, on unarmed or suspected unarmed um, suspects who were fleeing for minor offenses ranging, ranging from shoplifting to jay, jaywalking. And when you deploy a taser on someone, their muscles lock up and they can't, in most instances, even put their hands out. So they could suffer a lot of injury when they hit the ground called a secondary injury it could be broken teeth and bones and so forth. Uh, and in some cases, the DOJ report identified uses of force in those contexts, which they thought were unconstitutional and other ones they couldn't substantiate based on some ambiguity or, or, or ambiguous or incomplete record. But the fact that that practice exists uh, and, and presents a risk and is in inconsistent with the notion of using a taser for someone who's aggressive and assaultive rather than fleeing um, might be admissible in a future case to show that if it were the case, as it's not in the case in Baltimore, that they would continue the practice, notwithstanding having these, you know, this information shown to them and reported publicly. So I think I didn't yeah. draft that, but I think that's what that might yeah. be. It might be um, relevant to is notice to the department. Yep. Thank you. Um, sure. Committee, does anybody have any questions for Julio? And then, I, yes, Senator Ron Mansell. Um, I just, I wasn't sure if you wanted to go in section order versus witness order, because I was hoping the Attorney General's office could also comment on their past support for a Giglio registry and Brady file disclosure. Um, and I didn't know if you wanted to wait on that piece and see if they're still supportive of that or hear from Julio now. Um, well, I was, I guess we could. I, um, if you uh, 
do you um, have a comment on that one, Julio? Yeah, we, su we, we support we support a way for there to be consistent uh, information regarding impeachment material. That's the Giglio case or exculpatory material or uh, relating to, to mm -hmm. officers. I think um, there'll be testimony as the commissioner uh, mentioned earlier uh, relating to the details of, of those. But I think in general, the, the idea is yes, because uh, I, I don't think any prosecutor uh, in the state wants to uh, put on or fail to disclose to the defense information that they're constitutionally required to disclose simply because that officer may have worked at another department in another county uh, and have material that was disclosed in prior cases in the other county but wasn't available to them. Um, and I think it, it also, I, I think, um, so uh, providing mechanisms, and again, the details of how that's going to be done, I, I think is probably for a later time, but I think the idea of preventing that kind of error or oversight or inconsistency, um, you know, it's consistent. It's just, a, it seems like it's a mechanism designed to avoid uh, any inadvertent violations of, um, of due process rights, um, because even it's, it's, the constitutional standard doesn't require intent by the prosecutor. It's just the failure to disclose the information mm -hmm. uh, may, may end up in a, in, in a mistrial um, and, you know, with resources for um, maybe never being able to retry a, a criminal case, but also uh, expenses associated with retrying a case. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Um, so now I think we will jump to Bill Sorrell. I think that a number of these um, concern the Criminal Justice Council and around the training, the um, independent investigations. And I don't, I'm sure there's other things here and you're charged with keeping this, um, this file. So if you would like to go next, that would be great. Uh, thank you, Senator. <clears throat> I think I'll, uh, in the interest of uh, time and what you're trying to do today or what I think you're trying to do today, I'll kind of follow the lead of Commissioner uh, Sherling and, uh, and perhaps try to stay away from engaging in a way on any policy reasons for two reasons. One, I have, more qu I have a number of questions I want to pose in the draft as I read it several mm -hmm. weeks ago and how it might impact the council and its uh, proceedings and secondarily, uh, uh, we this is not a matter that we have put in its specifics before the full council, and so I'm the chair, but I don't want to pretend to speak for the council on mm -hmm. various substantive parts of the uh, proposal. So, uh, some uh, a, f a few concerns or just uh, questions. Uh, in uh, looking at a few different uh, uh, sub sections or subsections. One uh, F is on confidentiality and uh, it talks about information that's developed from that investigation of patterns and practices and such. And because we have uh, statutory authority over professional misconduct uh, by law enforcement officers, uh, it is possible that a matter that is referred to us that involves an allegation of professional misconduct by a law enforcement officer, we can send it back for a further investigation. If we think the investigation isn't as an adequate, we can do our own investigation. But then we take a look at the punishment, if any, imposed by the law enforcement, the, the employer, and we have ultimate authority to revisit the punishment, if you will, when there's a finding of misconduct. And those matters are handled confidentially by our professional regulation committee, but an officer who's the subject of an allegation of professional misconduct has the ability to not be satisfied with the decision by our professional regulation committee and may ask for a public hear a, a hearing by the full council, where the full council essentially sits as a jury, if you will. 
And I, I'm in an abundance of caution, I wanna make sure that the confidentiality guarantees about information developed during these investigations under that first section, that if any of that information makes it our way be, uh, in a case or cases involving professional misconduct, I, our hearings, when it's a contested hearing, are public hearings. And I don't want the council to run afoul of a prohibition or a confidentiality protection in 1F. Uh, so it, it's possible, depending on how this bill goes, that we might want a specific mention of the council's professional regulation and responsibilities not being hamstrung or uh, by this confidentiality provision. And maybe that's too much caution on my part, but I raise the issue. Uh, and then just a Bill, question. Can I just go back? I, I think that that section only refers to the investigations of law enforcement agencies, not law enforcement officers, I believe. Oh, but but uh, an investigation of an agency looks at specific instances of okay. conduct uh, by by okay. officers. Yep, got and it. And it's entirely possible that one or more issues that's in that investigative report would come to us through this other different mechanism, okay. looking at an individual officer or, or or more than one. Okay, got it. Um, right. Senator Ram Hinsdale, did you have a yeah, um, Bill, how many investigations have you all done so far? Uh, I, last I knew, uh, Senator, I, I, I thought we had somewhere in the area of 40 active cases. They might have been pared down some. Uh, the truth is, in order, we, we have a few members of the council who are on that professional regulation committee. And if and when someone appeals and wants a hearing before the full council, those members of that professional regulation committee would not be able to vote on guilt or innocence. That essentially because they're an investigative entity. So for example, I do not attend, participate in any meetings of the professional regulation committee, because if there's an appeal to the full council, I want to be able to act as chair of the council in the, the hearing before the council. So I don't know chapter and verse on how many of the active cases before the professional regulation uh, committee are likely to come to the full council. Uh, many of them sort of get settled at that at that level, but uh, it's possible that you should ask uh, uh, either uh, Chief Brickell, who's now our deputy executive director of the council, excuse me, of the police academy, but he was until recently when he came to work for the police academy, the chair of the professional regulation committee and, and his position as chair of the professional regulation committee has been taken over by Trevor, Trevor Whipple, the former South Burlington police chief, uh, who's a representative on the council from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Those two would be have more information for you uh, that I don't have now and don't want to have because I want to maintain my ability to participate in full council hearings uh, in contested cases. I, I thought that the co-chairs of the Professional Regulation Committee were Sheriff Anderson and Susanna Davis. They are. Yeah. Yes. So we have Sheriff Anderson with us here today. So if we, when we get, when um, you are done, we can ask him those very questions because I think right. they co-chair it. I didn't know Trevor no, Whipple. He, they're they're co-chairs of the full council. Oh, I thought they were of the professional regulation committee. No. Okay, no. got it. And, okay, and, and, I, uh, okay, I got yeah. it. No. Senator Clarkson. I was, on a, I was on a team's call with them this morning. Uh, so, no, they, so they're gonna, not on the professional regulation. 
Senator Clarkson, if you have a question, I'm, I realized that we interrupted um, Bill's testimony here. Um, so is your question about that? My question is a follow-up for Bill on investigations. I understand we're short on investigators in the state. So I'm just curious who does our investigations in these 40 cases? Uh, they're done initially, typically within the department where these the allegation of professional uh, misconduct, but sometimes the department will have an independent investigation done. They notify us when there's a complaint, then we get access to all of the information that they developed and the determination they made of either responsibility for professional misconduct or not. And if so, what punishment? And we are able to send back to them, asking them to investigate more uh, or to conduct our own investigation of a matter. And we are, as soon as we get the uh, clearance from the Department of uh, Human Resources, we will be advertising a funded position as our own investigator, which you and the legislature approved last session. Right, because I, I, I've heard, particularly with some of our smaller police departments and actually with some of our larger ones that they don't have the capacity, have had to spend a lot of money they didn't have on investigators doing this work. I mean, it, this strikes me as sort of a thorny challenge for some and, of our departments. And of course, uh, Senator, if the allegation of professional misconduct is against the head of a police agency, a police chief or a sheriff, uh, uh, then that entity really can't do the investigation and have it appear to be impartial, uh, you know. So, so then we would either see that another law enforcement agency would volunteer to do the investigation, or once we have our own paid investigator in house, uh, he or she will uh, lead such an investigation like that. Thank you. Do you want to continue with your, um, uh, uh, Senator Rom Hensdale, did you have a? Maybe, maybe Bill is gonna address it, but I just, I mean, I think the independence is the thing I've had the issue with for a long time that there are cases where people have reported feeling like someone way too close to the department was involved in the investigation. So I just didn't know if Bill had qualms with that particular piece or could address his feelings about the independence, the need for the independence of the investigation. Well, let me go back if, if, if I may to my time as attorney general, we were, we received any number of law enforcement investigations into uh, uh, cases involving death or serious bodily injury by law enforcement officers. And typically there's an understanding that within a department that you really can't do your own investigation on those matters, you're investigating your own. And so, uh, uh, frequently state police will be looked to if uh, uh, you name the town that has uh, an officer involved uh, shooting, for example, then uh, typically state police would do that investigation and then send the results of the investigation to the AG's office to determine whether criminal charges uh, are warranted. Uh, in the state police, uh, the commissioner can correct me if I'm mistaken, if there's a trooper or troopers are involved in uh, a, a deadly force incident, then within the large agency of the state police, they will have investigators from other parts of the state participate in those investigations to try to uh, uh, at least uh, temper some of those concerns that it's an in-house investigation is going to isn't going to be a fair investigation. Uh, you know, I, I understand when we get into the 
investigations that are further on in one of the sections here with this independent investigation that that's an attempt to uh, have more uh, of, of avoid the the concerns or appearances that this really wasn't a thorough fair uh, investigation of an incident because some one or one's too close to the matter at hand, the department at hand, uh, we're conducting it. I understand that and what you're trying to accomplish there, or I think I do anyway. So I'm gonna, um, a little torn here about whether we should let Bill continue or um, I think Commissioner Sherling has a, a response to that. Do you, Commissioner? Uh, very briefly, Madam Chair, just to add uh, to uh, General Sorrell's uh, information, at all correct uh, in the in instances where VSP uh, is investigating uh, serious bodily injury or death, it is done by a team from another area of the state unrelated to the barracks. Um, and I also just wanted to note for the committee that the uh, Vermont Association of Chiefs of Police put forward uh, a proposal now about 18 months ago uh, to create teams of investigators regionally that would do exactly what's being uh, described here. Thank you. So Bill, would you like to continue Yeah, and I'll try, to, I'll try to speed up. I, I don't no. mean to take too much of your time here. Uh, I did have a question under two, section 2B, which talks about liability uh, in certain cases and uh, I didn't section look at two, it. We're not doing section two. Oh, is that not in the, the draft you're looking at now? It is, but we're not going to do it because you that's the qualified immunity. Yeah, that was my question. I, I was no, wondering if there was an, under, an overlap. We're not, okay. we're not addressing that at all because judiciary has taken um, hours and hours of testimony on it. So good. Thank you. Uh, Section three, we, we note the uh, increased hours of anti-bias training, uh, but you mentioned Susanna Davis and Sheriff Anderson, and uh, we were on a call this morning with the executive director, the deputy executive director, and uh, among the topics we were discussing is just in preparation for future council proceedings and actions of the council uh, and training is, 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 is whether bias issues in policing should be under one committee for fair and impartial policing or whether uh, Susanna raised the question of whether they should, that issue should be essentially embedded in all aspects of our training curricula and uh, something for the full council uh, will be on the, on the plate for the full council discussion uh, uh, going forward. So uh, this is, you know, a change from four hours to 10 hours. Um, if we do this embedded thing of fair and impartial is more broadly part of virtually all aspects of the training curriculum, it might be a little bit difficult to uh, mathematically say, okay, we got our 10 hours in or something. I just Point that point that out that fair and impartial policing issues and training and appropriate training are very much a concern of the council. Uh, the section five, this there's this the council when there's a use of uh, death or serious bodily injury, the council is to designate a three member independent panel to uh, conduct an investigation. And I just my own notes, unclear whether the panel is to be constituted in whole or in part by council members, or it's just that the council is to appoint three independent investigators, none of whom are council members, one question. Secondarily, just because of the standard procedure in uh, use of deadly force, the investigation that we've been talking about or, you know, in the last 10 or 15 minutes, I'm curious what is envisioned. Uh, their troopers are involved in a, in a shooting. Uh, they're from 
the St. Albans barracks. And as the commissioner said, PSP will have investigators maybe from the Rutland barracks investigate that incident and give the report to the AG's office and to the relevant state's attorney's office where the incident took place. But this three member independent investigative panel that's envisioned in section five, does that wait for the investigation of whether there was criminal conduct? Is it run in parallel? Is it, does it go before the, uh, the, the law enforcement investigation of the incident? I can just see, uh, you know, some, some concerns there about who goes first and who controls what and access to the witnesses and uh, just want to think about those things a little bit. And then the council just gets the report. And I guess if that independent investigative panel thinks there's uh, nothing, no misconduct, then the report is made public. Uh, yeah. But there are provisions, there are also confidentiality provisions. Uh, there is the clear statement that the council can use the information from this investigation or these investigations in furtherance of our official duties, but then it's immediately followed by confidentiality protections for release of the information requiring the, the relevant law enforcement agency and the officer in question to, I, I, I think, give permission before a release of this information. And I, going back to my initial concerns earlier, Senator, that some matters of professional misconduct might be part and parcel of this investigate of an investigation under a use of deadly force or one with death or serious bodily injury. And same concerns about, I wouldn't wanna see the council's ability to act under its professional regulation responsibilities be impacted somehow by unintended consequences that tie our hands to use certain information in, 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 in our decisions or deliberations and such about whether punishment is warranted, uh, suspension of license, uh, whatever. Uh, so raise that question uh, and those are more questions which you know don't have to be answered today but I'd sure like to know, or we would like to know at some juncture here. And uh, and then just under section seven, I just not certain how the three member investigative uh, team that's under section seven uh, relates, if at all, to the use of force investigative panel that I was just talking about under uh, uh, under section five. Uh, and then I, oh, I see that uh, uh, oh yeah, the, that last thing I was saying were uh, concerns about the uh, use of the materials from uh, investigations that was under section uh, six. So uh, hopefully I haven't made things too confusing here, but these are questions or concerns that uh, from my reading several weeks ago, I had as it relates to council matters. I think I think that what we'll do is <coughs> we've been getting kind of an overview today, and then I think that what we'll do the next time is hone in on the sections and have and see what where we want to go with each section. Um, okay. Well, I apologize so, if I took too much of your time. No, uh, no, no. That's fine. Easy. Thank you. And we kept it interrupting you with questions, so. Um, Senator Ram Hinsdale, did you have a? Well, question? I just wanted to say in the meantime, Bill, I'm happy to get together with you and Ben and maybe some other folks who have looked at how independent investigation happens in other states. 
I think this section is a is a victim of figuring out how you create true independent investigation without having a kind of independent investigation unit. It shouldn't really live with the attorney general's office. It shouldn't be internal to law enforcement. That's not independent. So, you know, looking to you all, but also recognizing we've heard a lot of concerns about, you know, if you have an all law enforcement panel, if you have someone in that group who has had ties to that particular county's law enforcement, that it no longer feels independent. So that's the overall intent. And I'm sure the language could probably be clearer and make sure that there's not duplicative pieces. Happy to have such a meeting with you, Senator. Thank you. So I think that maybe we'll jump next. Thank you, Bill. Oh, you're welcome. I, I think we'll jump next maybe to Sheriff Anderson, who is the one of the co-chairs. I was thinking that you were the co-chair of the um, professional regulation board, but now I see you're the co-chair of the whole shebang. So um, if you would like to give your thoughts on this to start with. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, committee. Uh, for the record, Mark Anderson, Wyndham County Sheriff. I am here in my capacity as president of the Vermont Sheriff's Association. Uh, while I'm not here uh, in my capacity as the co-vice chair of the council, I'm happy to speak from that perspective. I'm also happy to speak from the perspective of a sheriff. Uh, I am joined by Sheriff Harlow from Orleans County, who's also second vice president, and she's actually going to be taking the lead on this bill. Um, so uh, originally I was supposed to be in fair and impartial policing training today uh, during this committee hearing, uh, but the instructor was injured. And so I decided to join Sheriff Harlow uh, as support. Um, I'm happy to speak to this, but I would like to defer to Sheriff Harlow if uh, Madam Chair will allow. Very happily will allow. Thank you. Thank you. So Jennifer, do you wanna, there you are. Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome, hello, every committee. I'm, um, for the record, sorry, I'm Jennifer Harlow with the Orleans County Sheriff. I have a little bit of a sinuses, so I apologize for <clears throat> my voice. So um, as Sheriff Anderson introduced me, the Vermont Sheriff Association, we wanna be part of this um, conversation about professionalism and accountability. We also wanna be um, very um, supportive in providing funding and resources to initiate what's already underway, which you've already heard a lot about, which is already a lot of good things that are happening. We wanna support the council's professional regulation subcommittee's work that's already being done and is continuing to move forward. Um, and, you know, we, we are very in much support of the training and um, support um, more education for agency executives um, and things of that nature. So I don't want to continue with um, stuff that's already been duplicated, but we um, I'm happy that we were invited in, to be part of this conversation. Thank you. And I guess when we get into more detail, we will. Um, uh, we'll get into more detail. <laughs> Um, so I think with that, does anybody have any questions for Jennifer? And then I'm going to jump to um, Chief Pete. Are you representing the police chiefs? Or are you here for yourself? In any case, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good evening, uh, members of the committee. Uh, for the record, Brian Pete with the Montpelier Police Department. I also serve as the uh, first vice president for the uh, Vermont Association of Chiefs of Police. I don't see uh, Jennifer Frank on, so I can just quickly give um, uh, just an overview as from that representation um, that the uh, VACOP does um, support the work that's being done and looking at accountability systems and mechanisms um, that we also do support additional training. Uh, they're just questions revolving around the funding and the resources because there's lot, lots of additional training that's in the pipeline um, and seeing how that falls and where the dust settles and where we want to make sure that we're not being redundant in certain ways. Um, uh, and again, uh, the resources aspect of it is a, is a big thing. Uh, and then just to, uh, again, uh, like Sheriff Harlow had said, uh, we're, we're happy and, and, and uh, hopeful to be part of the process and to look at uh, uh, honest collaboration uh, to figure out how we can do this in a, in, a, in a good way that's going to continue to build upon trust uh, and, and move us forward as we're doing in 21st century policing. Thank you. Um, so yes, Senator Ramhinsdale. And just for context, we may wanna have Aton in because 
I completely hear Chief Pete on resources. I believe he um, Aton went originally to appropriations with the request about additional training and you know, we this was an attempt to give it another hearing in the policy committee of jurisdiction so that it didn't get lost as a budgetary matter. Um, so it might not have the right appropriation attached to it right now. Yeah, I think that, I mean, we will have Aton in and we'll also have Susanna Davis in because I, I, I do understand the idea of embedding the, um, discriminatory, the uh, racial justice training in and anti-bias training in all in all the training, instead of saying this is this is a P, this is then and now we're going to check off the box and instead having it embedded in in everything that all the training. And I think we heard that before when we were talking about um, anti-bias training, that that was one of the issues that was brought up then. So um, I think I'm going to jump. I see Sheriff Anderson has his hand up. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just I did want to speak briefly to I believe it was Section Eight. Yep. No, correction, Section Four. Um, this is four. on fair and impartial policing and data collection. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd like to flag for the committee uh, a body of work done by the Racial Disparities. At RDAP. Uh, I'm not going to say the full acronym, but uh, by RDAP, uh, I have a small acorn of technical information to share about how data is currently collected in Vermont, uh, how it is researched. Uh, I'm not a PhD uh, uh, person. I am not a researcher. Uh, and when I do talk with researchers, such as Robin Joy from CRG, uh, Stephanie Seguino from UVM, uh, and others, uh, I was just in a training with uh, Dr. Johnson from, I believe it's the University of Toledo, um, somewhere out West. Uh, the, the hard part with racial data is that we want to make sure that A, we are measuring what we want to measure, and then B, that we are using the correct benchmarks to measure it against. Uh, and this is, uh, we have learned a lot over the last five years that we have been capturing this data. Uh, I also serve conveniently uh, as a mechanism to help uh, deploy, or I should say submit all Vermont law enforcement agencies race data to the council, uh, which is required by law. Uh, that's just because I know how to use a computer, not because I'm anything special. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, it puts me into the nitty gritty of uh, this data, how it's captured, uh, and then working with the researchers of how they process it. Uh, so I, I would like to flag that uh, RDEP has a, a strong body of uh, information. There is a bill uh, with regards to, I believe it's the, uh, the Bureau, uh, which would fall under, the, uh, under Zuzana Davis's office uh, regarding uh, storage of uh, race data uh, across the entire enterprise of state government uh, to make sure that we are using similar uh, definitions uh, in fact, uh, the federal definitions differ from uh, state definitions, and so it can create difficulties in, in communicating. So just wanted to put that out there. Uh, there's other committees talking about this as well, uh, and I think that uh, we should be capturing this data and we should be reporting it out in a way that's useful uh, to committees such as yours. Uh, but also to law enforcement agencies. Um, we don't currently get education uh, as agency heads or uh, or supervisors, managers within law enforcement agencies on how to read these reports. Um, so it's based on what you come to the table with uh, and how you're able to work on it. Uh, and I would encourage that we also consider resources for providing what's not law enforcement training, it's how to use Excel, it's how to use statistical programs, it's how to understand data. Uh, thank you. So maybe you can answer the question that I asked earlier about the, the um, the logistics of this, because the way I read this, this is data that's supposed to be collected if there is a um, uh, an officer involved death or serious bodily injury. But you don't know that when you stop the person. So how does this collect this data get collected after the fact? Or am I reading that? Am I not understanding how data is collected? So with uh, roadside stops, uh, this data is collected and it's uh, the systems that we use to collect the data 
uh, is based on input from the law enforcement officer who's conducting the stop uh, as part of their reporting requirements. Uh, so the um, we do collect this uh, in terms of uh, the officer involved death or serious bodily injury. Uh, we've been collecting it without the officer involved death or serious bodily injury. Uh, so to add that extra layer, um, I, I don't think would be a, an issue around collection uh, unless we were just simply not aware that a, an injury occurred or a death for that matter, um, which I don't see happening, but um, we'll, I'll leave that out there. The, um, did that answer your question, Madam Chair? Um, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure because are you saying you already collect all this information? Uh, with a quick review of the list. Uh, yes, Madam Chair. All right. Okay. So, um, okay. So that's collected at the stop at the time of the stop. So if there's an incident afterwards or at the, then it's already there, it's already collected. Correct. And okay. I mean, this is where we can go to discuss what are we trying to measure and what are we trying right. to inform. Um, the, the primary goal of initiatives such as this is to identify uh, where a police officer has discretion to help uh, identify if implicit or explicit bias uh, is being used in enforcement action. So that's the intent. Uh, and it's not uncommon for lists similar to this to be used. Uh, but then we start to add on and add on and add on. And then very quickly, the data becomes um, uh, skewed in uh, the, the uh, back end side where the researchers are, are using the data. So um, what I, I won't speak to policy uh, right now. Uh, I'm certainly happy to do it another time when you have more time. Um, but there is a lot of people with a lot more knowledge than I have who are uh, able to speak to the research. Uh, it, research is changing uh, and capturing it. Uh, I'll suggest that capturing it in legislation, uh, the specifics uh, in legislation uh, might be uh, slower to maintain pace with current research than capturing the intent of the policy and requiring an entity within state government, not law enforcement agencies. And maybe I'll say Zuzana's office just as a possible idea, uh, but capturing a body or, or organization that's capable of saying, this is what we need to capture. And then we can scale up records keeping systems to do those things. And we can do it based on really smart people with PhDs who research these things. And it, or it could be ADS that the, the information, the policies are developed by somebody else, but the information is all, anyway, anyway, okay, all right. Then what I yeah. suggest is that the, the legislature require the, the intent of this mm -hmm. language while capturing the in the weeds, nitty gritty uh, elsewhere uh, in a body that's not law enforcement, but is able to work with law enforcement to help direct the capturing of those items. Thank you. I think we will jump to um, where I'm looking here. Chris Raquel, there, I see you there. Thank you. Hi. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. I, I wasn't expecting to be uh, here to testify, but I'm happy to make some very brief comments if it is helpful at all when it comes to the investigatory phase that was described by Chair Sorrell um, earlier. And there, there are some, some competing factors here in that, that let me briefly tell you if, it, if it's helpful about the professional regulation committee and, and the things that they hear. So when you're trying to get into an impartial investigation, the, the complaints that come to the council come from any source and we accept them from any source. So they might come directly from the law enforcement agency themselves, or they might come from the general public, or they might even come anonymously. And so when we take that information, if it is about a specific law enforcement officer from an agency, it's initially directed back to that agency to do their own internal affairs investigation. Once that's complete, that investigatory file then comes to the committee for their review. And they can do a number of things. They can send it back for further. They can ask questions. They can do their own investigation. And um, to make matters even a little clearer, when, it, when the allegation is against an agency head, a chief or a sheriff or any type of agency head, 
that is a council investigation. That doesn't go back to the agency for them to do their, their own investigation. And as was mentioned earlier, and I think it might have been by Commissioner Sherling, that there was a joint effort um, on behalf of the Vermont Association of Chiefs of Police, and I believe sheriffs were a part of that as well, to form these teams so that they can do regionalized um, internal affairs investigations from outside the area where there is an allegation of misconduct so that officers from a nearby area are not um, involved in those investigations. And I can say that um, as, as the former chair of that committee, but now um, overseeing that committee as it sits with the council, the, the investigation, when you question the impartiality of it, so it's made up of five council members, one who has a former law enforcement background, um, some, uh, one member is from the, the uh, network of domestic violence. We, uh, we have people from the BIPOC community. So there's a very wide range of um, expertise that sits on this committee and very lively and robust discussion that also happens within that committee. And the law enforcement person or the person with law enforcement experience is really only to explain to the other committee members sometimes police conduct or practice or policy that they don't quite understand. And there's amazing conversation that goes on there. So uh, I can honestly say that it's, a, it's an unbiased view and many viewpoints are taken and considered. And the committee is taking a lot of action that you're going to see before the, the council very soon. There was also the mention of um, hearings that were coming before the council. And also there are some um, opportunities for stipulation agreements to be drafted where an officer certification might be given up based on what the committee has already decided and offers to an officer um, in lieu of going before a hearing before a public body. Some that have misconduct issues may choose not to go and contest that and go before a public body. So in the same context, we don't want to lose those that information. And when we have misconduct that's very clear and people that may not want to go before a public body, there's another avenue to still resolve the certification issue. And again, we're talking about law enforcement certification. That's, that's the critical piece for us. So once you don't have your certification, you don't have a job. It's that simple in law enforcement. But that's just kind of a broad overview of how that um, committee works, and they do have a, a set of guidelines, procedures that they have drafted. It's been there's a formal mechanism by which that committee does their investigations. Thank you. Um, I think we will jump. We have VLCT with us here, and I see both Gwen and Karen, and I don't know how you want to how you want to do this if you want to tag team or what you how you want to do this but we'd love to hear from you great um thank you committee vermont league of cities and towns here it's gwen zakoff and karen horn um we really appreciate sitting through all the testimony that precedes us because i think a lot of it covered a, a lot of the bases that we have identified as we did a uh, walk through on our own of the bill um had, having a lot of questions more than sort of responses um, because there uh, overall seem to be a lot of like duplicative language and some of the systems that have been already set up have already been set up. And we're hoping that, you know, moving forward that any kind of proposals will be sort of scaffolding around the building blocks that are already there to help it become um, uh, better solidified and rather than having um, uh, duplicative processes that um, sort of uh, uh, make the process not as um, impactful. So there's a lot of uh, growth happening, a lot of learning happening along the way, and um, it's really encouraging to hear um, the responses from a lot of the new members of the Criminal Justice Council and sort of the, the learning that's going on uh, there. And um, we're just really hopeful that these conversations actually lead to um, providing more resources and better training. And, 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 and particularly, I'm happy that the, the prior testimony touched upon sort of the leadership training, you know, really helping, um, you know, our sheriffs and, and police chiefs become better leaders. And, um, and so we, uh, yeah, so we're, we're going to wait until uh, we have more time to actually 
you know, walk through the bill in sort of each section, but I think there's a lot of good stuff here as long as it's embedded in a way that makes sense with the processes that are already in place. Karen, did you want to add anything? Thank you, Thank Gwen. Thank you, Senator. No, I think Gwen has covered it for us. Thanks. Thank you. So, committee, I think that the way we'll do this, um, the, the, the next time we take this up, what we'll do is we'll start going through it section by section because it, it's hard to have somebody kind of comment on the whole bill. Um, so I think what we'll do is start taking it section by section and you will all be invited. And if you have nothing to say about that section, that's okay, you can sit with us anyway, or you don't have to come. But so I think that that's the way we'll do it. And we'll, um, uh, yeah. Does that make sense, committee? Because I th it's too hard to- um, Yes, I think that makes to address sense. address a whole bill that has so many different parts. So we'll start going through it. and. We'll take on all the sections with the exception of section two. Great. Okay. And I will, I can't, I was just looking at my, my little chart here to see if we had this on um, for next week. We don't have it on yet, but I've had to do some changes already in next week's schedule. So. We'll see, it'll either be next week or the next week, <coughs> remembering that we only have three weeks left until crossover, but we will, we will schedule this in, okay? Great, thank you. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Ben. Pleasure, thank you, Ben. Lovely to meet you. And great to meet all of you, too. <laughs>